Uh, dear Father, dear God, thank you so much for, for your love for us. Thank you for Jesus, who is our Savior, who died on the cross for our sins, who rose from the dead, who is now up in heaven, according to the book of Hebrews, as our great high priest in the temple which you pitched and not man. And as we continue this theme, moving down toward the closing scenes of this earth's history before Jesus returns, and we pray that you will help us. Please bless us. Please bless me. Bless those who are watching uh, right now on the live stream and those who will be watching the recording in the future. May this be a rich study of the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Okay, the foundation of his throne, Psalm 99, verse 1, says that the Lord, what does he do? He reigns, and one of these days, the whole world is going to see, you know, God when, when Jesus comes. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. And now, in order to really understand this verse, we need to understand the sanctuary <clears throat> because the Bible describes God's presence sitting between the cherubim inside the most holy place of the sanctuary. We talked about that in part two, and that there was an earthly temple that had two rooms, it had a holy place and a most holy place. We, and I showed you in the book of Revelation uh, and in the book of Hebrews that there is that the earthly temple was a shadow of the heavenly temple, the real temple where Jesus Christ is our high priest. And when this verse says that, that God sits between the cherubims, this is a direct uh, reference to the most holy place of the sanctuary, which had a golden box called the ark. It had a golden lid on top of it. Underneath the lid were different articles of furniture. Uh, the primary article was the Ten Commandments, the Tables of the Covenant. And I'll show you that in just a minute again, in case you missed the earlier meeting. And there were golden angels uh, that, were, that were posted on each side of the of the mercy seat, and these angels were looking downward. They were statues representing the heavenly host, uh, showing that the angels are very interested in the union of, of uh, the mercy seat with justice and the law of God and the plan of salvation to get sinners up into heaven. And that's what the whole plan of salvation is about. <clears throat> and between the cherubim there was a light. Anybody remember the name, what they used to call that, the Hebrew word? Shekinah. Right, the Shekinah. <clears throat> right, the Shekinah was the, uh, the presence. <clears throat> it was a, a light that was the glory. It shone the glory of God. And in the Old Testament, God was represented uh, as sitting, and he was sitting through his presence in the sanctuary, at least during the time when his presence was uh, in, the, in the most holy place. His presence was there, and he, so he was represented as sitting between the cherubims on, the th on his throne. And his throne was represented by the ark. And underneath the mercy seat were the tables of the covenant the tables of his law representing the foundation of his throne. Now let's just look at a few verses about this. Uh, Hebrews, we looked at this earlier. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4 describe the sanctuary, <coughs> the earthly sanctuary. And then verse, uh, verse 3, Hebrews 9, 3, Paul wrote that after the second veil, you, it was, you'd go through the first veil to get into the holy place. And then you'd go through the second veil, or the high priest would, 
to get into the most holy place. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. See that? So the tables were in the ark. And then verse 5 says, over it <clears throat> were the, the cherubims of glory, those two angels, shadowing the mercy seat, <clears throat> of which we cannot now speak particularly. So Paul felt that in his day, the Holy Spirit <clears throat> was, uh, was leading him not to go into too many details about what happened in the most holy place. But later on, as we get down in the stream of time, especially as we get to Revelation, we see that God zeroes us in on what's happening in there, which we'll look at in just a bit. Go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 5. Deuteronomy 10, verse 5. Also goes into detail about the most holy place and what was uh, placed in there. In verse, um, actually we can start with verse three. It says, I made, an, I made an ark, Moses wrote this, I made an ark of shittim wood and hooed the two tables of stone like the first and I went up into the mount, Mount Sinai, having the two tables in my hand and he, referring to God, he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, because Moses broke the first tables. If you remember when the Israelites built the golden calf, uh, he was so incensed by that that Moses threw down those tables and they broke. So he wrote on the second tables according to the first writing. And what did he write? He wrote the Ten Commandments which the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the, of the fire, in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. And Moses said, I turned, <clears throat> I turned myself, and I came down from the mountain, and I put the tables, the two tables of stone, where did he put them? He put them right inside the ark. And that's why it's called the Ark of the Covenant, <clears throat> because the tables are called the tables of the covenant, God's covenant with his people. And the tables were put inside the Ark, and that's why the Ark was called the Ark of the Covenant. And Moses wrote, and there they be, <clears throat> as the Lord commanded me. I'm going to get a little more of my power drink, Stacy. I'm running out of this. <clears throat> Got to cherish every drop. Hmm. All oh, that cayenne <clears throat> and uh, whatever else is in there. <clears throat> and garlic and ginger and. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. You know, all the verses that I've been leading you through really point to this text. <clears throat> this is really um, one of the hot spots in the book of Revelation. Revelation's my favorite book. I've been reading it for 43 years. I've memorized large portions of this book. I love this book. It's so powerful. <clears throat> and in Revelation 11:19, 19, what's happening <clears throat> is that uh, God is seeking to bring us into the, into the throne room of the universe, into the center of Jesus Christ's ministry in behalf of fallen humanity. <clears throat> this is the hot spot. Verse 19 says, And the temple of God 
And so this is God's temple. <clears throat> it's not a... <clears throat> It's not uh, an earthly temple. Where is it? The temple of God was opened where? Up in heaven. That's right. It's it's up there. Boy, I've still got this kind of frog in my throat. Let me drink a little more water. Mm, Sorry, you have to endure this. I'm sure other people know what it's like to get sick. Not, you wish you were healthy, you know, when you're preaching. But I am overall healthy, except I've got a little bit left of my cold. Okay, so let's try again. The temple of God was opened. So this is God's way of opening up the center of the universe. It was opened up in heaven, and that's where Jesus is, as our great priest. And it says, there was seen in his temple. Now that word seen has really impressed me that throughout the book of Revelation, John will say things like, I saw, I heard, I fell down, I was told to write this or that. But in this verse, he says, there was seen. He doesn't say, I saw. He said, there was seen. And the difference between I saw and there was seen means that if it was just I saw, then he's the only one that saw it. But if there was, uh, when it says there was seen, what does that imply? That's right, that other people see it too. And I believe that we see it by faith. As we study the Bible with the eyes of faith, we can look up into the heavenly temple And we, as a group, see. And what was seen in his temple? What was seen? It says the ark, right? The ark of his testament. And this revelation is so important that what follows is there were lightning. So if you can imagine, you know, seeing the ark in the most holy place behind the second veil. And then all of a sudden there's lightnings flashing, you know, and then it says there were voices. What those voices said, we don't really know, but there were voices and there was thundering. So there's, you know, the rumbling of thunder like a storm. And there was an earthquake. And some of this is what happened on Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. And we'll go to that in just a a moment. This is imagery that's pointing us back to Mount Sinai. There was a trumpet on Mount Sinai. There was the earth was shaking on Mount Sinai. There was fire on Mount Sinai. And then it says there was also a great hail. So if you just look at this verse, it seems to me that there's an awful lot of fireworks going on in this text. And it just, uh, it impresses me as a student of the Bible that this verse is designed to get people's attention. Wouldn't you agree? This is God's way of trying, of saying, you know, take a close look at this. This is very important. When the temple opens and we get to go in by faith and see the ark and see all these manifestations of God's power. God is trying to impress us with something. And and again, uh, when you study what the Bible says about the ark, it had a golden lid on it. Inside of the ark was the pot of manna and the rod that budded. But the most important article of furniture by far was what? It was the the tables of the covenant which contained the Ten Commandments. It was God's law. So if you picture God is sitting on the throne between the cherubim and his throne is the ark and in the ark is the uh, Ten Commandments, when you you just put the pieces together, what, what God is trying to tell us from this whole scene is that the Ten Commandments 
that God's law is the foundation of his throne. It's the foundation of his government, his government of the entire universe. It, it contains the principles of righteousness that are the principles of his character. They're the principles that he uh, operates by. <clears throat> They're the principles that he has given to his creation, to humanity, to the whole universe. They're all uh, incorporated in the Ten Commandments. Now let's go back to Exodus and let's take a closer look at these. In Exodus, let's go to chapter 19. And I think that as we go through these, what we're going to do in the, in the rest of this meeting, pretty much, is we are going to go through all 10 of the commandments. We're just going to go through them one by one by one. I've, I've given this talk many, many times, and I've had people come to me, and they've, they've said, you know, Steve, I've been you know, going to church all my life, and I've never heard the 10 commandments. Uh, some people have said, I've heard about the 10 commandments a lot, but I really don't know what they say. And in this world, I think if you were to ask the, the average person on the street, have you heard of the Ten Commandments? They'd say, oh yeah. Uh, my, my mother's husband, my mom is dead now, but her husband, uh, Bill, he's Jewish, and we had a conversation once, and I, I mentioned the Ten Commandments, and he said, oh yeah, I believe in the Ten Commandments. I've kept them all. I keep all the Ten Commandments. And I said, oh Really? Do you? And I said, what are the Ten Commandments? And at that point, he wasn't, you know, wasn't sure. He said, do you know what the fourth one is? Or the ninth one? Or the seventh one? Or the eighth one? And then you know, he realized, well, you know, I try to keep the principles of, of doing what's right and being a good person. But when it comes to the details of what's actually there, he didn't know. And if you ask the average person, have you heard of the Ten Commandments? They would probably say yes. But if you ask them, do you know what commandment number two is? They've probably failed the test. So let's, uh, let's take a look. And now, and the background of God giving his law starts in verse, well, the whole chapter. But if we look at verse 16, Exodus 19, 16, it says, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. And that's what's quoted in Revelation, right? Thunders, lightnings, earthquake. That's in Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. There were thunders and lightnings. There was a thick cloud on the mount, which was Mount Sinai. And the voice of the trumpet was exceedingly loud so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. Now, this was the people of Israel. They had come out of Egypt uh, at the hand of Moses, and God did all the miracles. He sent the 10 plagues, one after another. Finally, Pharaoh said, enough is enough, you can go. And if you know the, the history, eventually they came out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, and God brought them to a mountain, to this mountain called Mount Sinai. And on the third day of them being at the mountain, then uh, the fireworks began and the cloud came down on the mountain and the, the thunder and the lightning started flashing and the tr there was a trumpet that sounded summoning the people and the trumpet was so loud that all the people that were in the camp, they were shaking in their boots. Can you imagine? Imagine if we were all there, you know, and there's not a lot of mountains in Missouri that I can see, but at least not around here. But if you can imagine, you know, being in the wilderness, you've come out of Egypt, you're with God's people, it's a big event, and you're all there, and you look at the mountain, and the mountain is, is now shaking, and the, the lightning is there, and the thunder is there, and there's a trumpet sounds, <clears throat> and these people were scared, and they were trembling. They were shaking because it was such a, a, a fearful sight. And then verse 17 says, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. <coughs> and they stood at the, 
at the lower part of the mountain. Verse 18 says, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. <clears throat> and the smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. And why did, why did God do that? Why did God show himself with such incredible glory and majesty on that day? What was the reason for that? What was he about to do? That's right. He was about to give the people the Ten Commandments. And it was a very uh, sol solemn and sacred occasion. And, and the fireworks that are in this text are carried over into the book of Revelation, into Revelation eleven nineteen, when the temple of God is opened and we, can't, we have a, 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 a window, a vision into the hotspot of the creator of the universe. And we see the ark in which is the Ten Commandments. Now, the next verse, in verse um, 19, says, when the, when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke. And then it says, God answered him by a voice. And as you keep reading this, these verses, eventually what happens is all the people are there in expectation of what God is about to say. And what he says is recorded in chapter 20. Verse by verse by verse. So Moses didn't just come down from the mountain holding the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> but God actually spoke them. <clears throat> he spoke them one by one as the people were there. And I can imagine <clears throat> that there were um, heavenly angels all around that assembly trying to keep every evil angel out. They don't want any devils in there, no demons, no distraction. <clears throat> the Lord wanted the full attention of his people so that he went, when he went down one by one by one through the Ten Commandments, showing to them the principles of his government, he wanted the people to be very attentive and to listen and to take in every word. Don't you think so? So now look at chapter 20. And let's do this. Mm. Mm. Chapter 20, verse 1. It says, And God spoke all these words. Now let's just stop there. <clears throat> There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of people speaking in this world today. Isn't that right? <clears throat> you go on social media, you go on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, turn on the radio, turn on the TV. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of words coming out of human mouths. <clears throat> My belief is that the Lord wants us to close our ears to all the things that man is saying <clears throat> and to listen to what he's saying. Doesn't that make sense? Sometimes the volume is so loud that, we, that his voice is, so, is too soft. If you're having a hard time hearing the voice of God, 
<clears throat> maybe you need to turn down the volume of other things. Make sense? Other voices are too loud. And not that we should never talk or say anything, <clears throat> but we need to listen to what God has to say. More than anything else, it says God spoke all these words. And he said, <clears throat> verse uh, two, if I can just imagine you know, that this voice echoing throughout the camp. I am the Lord, your God, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. <clears throat> so there's the first commandment. Now let's talk about this because there's a lot there. Uh, first he says, I'm, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one that did all this. I'm the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? <clears throat> out of the house of bondage. <clears throat> Are there any other translations besides bondage? Slavery. Slavery right now. A lot of people think that God's law is bondage and that God's law is slavery. <clears throat> That's what the devil uh, said in heaven. He was the first transgressor of God's law. And he convinced the angels, uh, many of the angels, a third of the angels, that God's law and his principles of his government, of his throne, his principles of his character and who he is and how he operates, and that that's really bondage. And if they wanted to be free, and they really needed to go a different direction. You know, that's the devil's line. But God is trying to clarify things here. He's saying, I brought you out of bondage to give you my law. So that tells us that God's law is the opposite of bondage. It's the opposite of slavery, <clears throat> which would mean <clears throat> that it is uh, a law of freedom, which is what James says in James chapter 2, verse 12. He calls it uh, the law of liberty. And, he, and he's specifically quoting the Ten Commandments. James says that in James 2, verses 10, 11, and 12. He quotes the Ten Commandments, and he calls this a law of liberty. It's a law of freedom. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, God, his goal... <coughs> Boy, I'm sorry. I'm trying to clear my throat. <coughs> his goal as our, as our God, as our maker, as the one who loves us, is not to bring us into bondage. God does not want to hurt you. He does not want you to, to make you a slave. He wants your life to be happier. He wants you to be free, free in your relationship with him. Um, sure, you can bring one of those up. Let me bring me a cough drop, <laughs> thanks. Uh, he, he wants what's good for us. Yeah, thank you. Well, when I'm weak, I'm strong and it's all right. God can still speak through a, a hoarse voice, can't he? He can. So we'll just have to live with that. Mm. Now, here, here's another point. Um, what was the last straw to bring the people out of Egypt? Remember, there were 10 plagues. God sent 10 plagues. The water turned to blood, the flies came, the lice came, and all these terrible things happened. But there was one final plague. That was right, the death of the firstborn. And how did God protect the Israelites from the angel of death. It was the blood, that's right, the blood put on the doors in the form, you know, on the top and on the sides, which if you draw a line, what would that form? A cross, that's right. And the blood of the lamb symbolized the blood of who? The blood of Jesus, right? The blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for the sins of the world that has broken his law. And so God brought Israel out of bondage, 
under the sign of the blood of the Lamb, brought them to Mount Sinai to give the people his Ten Commandments so that he could keep them free. Amen. See that? So people think, well, you know, we don't need the law, we have the blood. And people say, and, and people say well, we're not saved by the law, we're saved by the blood. And I believe that. We're not saved by the law, we're saved by the blood. But the blood is what cleanses us from sin so that we can get out of bondage and then so by God's grace, we can keep the law and we can stay free. That's what his law is all about. Now, when you look at the, you know, that, that verses, uh, verse two is kind of like preliminary. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. That's really the heart of the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Now, let's just talk about that. Is that a, is that a bad commandment? Is that a bondage commandment? Is, would any of us in our right minds conclude that it's bad for us to put God first? I mean, no Christian in their right mind would come to that conclusion, right? Uh, and, and can you see how this is the found, this is part of the foundation of his throne? Is that, is that human beings and, and whatever other beings are out there in his universe, that they, that they have God as the center of their lives? What part of that commandment would you want to change? Or would you want to find fault with? Obviously, nothing. The first commandment is a good commandment, it's a perfect commandment, it's a righteous commandment. It's part of the principles of God's character. It's, it's the foundation of his throne that we put him first because he's the one that made us. And not only did he make, make us, but he redeemed us. <clears throat> he redeemed us <clears throat> out of uh, bondage from the, from the rule of the devil through the blood of the lamb. See that? So it doesn't make sense to say that we're saved by the blood, but we don't want to keep the law because the first command of the law says, put God first in your life. It doesn't make sense. So that's number one. And number two, <clears throat> says, you shall not make for yourself any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is, <coughs> that is in the earth beneath. Man, I feel like I'm just an inch away from getting rid of this, but it won't go away. Just trying to clear that throat and it won't seem to clear. Mm. Whew. Mm, my face getting red? <clears throat> that cayenne is uh, pretty hot. So God, first he says, I'm number one. And second he says, don't make any idols of anything that you think is me. Because I'm not those. I'm not those things. I'm not those physical things. Uh, any graven image, an image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands, or thousands of generations of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now here he's talking about thousands of generations. How many, we haven't even, you know, we're still within that time frame, aren't we? And we're talking about, you know, back in the days of, of Israel, on Mount Sinai, God is looking beyond 
thousands of generations. In other words, he's looking as far off as he can look. This law is not going away. This law written by God himself with his own finger. Now, we know what idols are. I mean, idols can be a, a statue. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, all statues are inherently wrong. Some people think that. I don't think that because God told the Israelites to build statues of the angels and to put them inside the most holy place. So this is not a, a categorical statement that you should that you know every single statue is automatically evil. But what God doesn't want is you to think of that statue as him and try to worship him through the statue. And he says, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. That's what he doesn't want. Um, and, and I've thought about this and it says a graven image. And, and most of us today, I mean, there are, there are in one religion, and especially in the Catholic Church, they do have statues. And there are other religions that do have statues and they actually do bow down to those statues. And that's wrong. It's breaking the second commandment. Uh, but there's other ways that we can have images. You can have a mental image, can't you? You can have an image of, of God that isn't right. That can be an idol. If you have an image in your mind of what you think God is like, but that image doesn't line up with scripture, then that image can be an idol. Uh, people can be idols. If you put a person above the Lord, that's idolatry, right? Um, does it mean that we shouldn't know people? You know, does it mean we shouldn't drive cars? But you can put your, you can make your car an idol. Amen. You can make your house an idol. You can make money an idol. You know, there's all kinds of things that we can have as idols. Not that those things themselves are wrong, but if we put, if we make those things more important than God, then that thing is an idol, right? And, uh, and God is trying to cleanse us from idolatry. Now, now, let me ask you, do you think this is a good commandment or a bad commandment? Is there anything wrong with that commandment? Anything you'd like to change? And say, well, Lord, just get rid of that one because that's not a good one. You know, that's for the Old Testament people. That's not for us because, because, well, because what? You know, don't you think God still wants us to put him first and not to have anything before him? Of course he does. Because it's an eternal principle. It's, it's the foundation of his government. It's the part of the rule, you know, of, of the universe that uh, the beings that he has made are happier, they work better, they have better relationships when they put God first and don't bow down to any things. Doesn't that make sense? These are, these are eternal principles. This is the foundation of the throne of God. Now, another point <clears throat> is that... <clears throat> At the end of verse uh, five, it talks about those who, who hate me. And then at the end of verse six, it says those that love me and keep my commandments. So there's really, there's, there's two options. And we either hate the Lord or we love the Lord. See that? It's amazing how, you know, we, we can't be neutral in this world. There's no third uh, option. Ultimately, we're going to be either on God's side totally or we're on the side of the devil. It's like the angels in heaven when they finally divided and one group followed Lucifer and one group followed, followed God. And there was no middle ground, right? It was one side or the other. You're either with God or you're against him. Jesus said, you're either, he said, he that's not with me is against me. So we're either, I, I had a, a student of mine in California years ago when I used to teach high school Bible. <clears throat> and uh, I was 
visiting with a student named Kevin in the cafeteria. And we started talking about riding the fence. And is it, is it possible to ride the fence between God and the devil? And I still remember this. He was a 17-year-old, I think. And he said a very profound line for a 17-year-old. He said, um, you can't ride the fence because the devil owns the fence. And I thought, smart kid. <laughs> it's a smart line. And that's the way it is. We can't ride the fence. Ultimately, God is describing humanity. And humanity is, is ultimately going to be on one side or the other concerning these principles, these eternal principles that can never change. The foundation of his throne, the principles of his government. We, we're either going to end up loving him or hating him. It's a, it's a vicious war that we're in. And the devil, you know, he's not neutral, is he? He hates God. He despises him. He despises his principles. He despises what he stands for. Everything about God, the devil hates, and he's at war with them. And if you go through these Ten Commandments, you, you, and if you really think about it, every single Ten every one of the Ten Commandments, Satan is at war with. He hates the idea of God being first. He hates the idea of, uh, of us having no things before the Lord. You know, this is what the devil does. Now, another point is that, you know, some people think, well, if we just have love, you know, that's all we need. And I believe that, but as long as it's true love. Now, God says um, he shows mercy. So mercy is in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> he shows mercy. It's not all justice. There's mercy there, right in the law. Mercy is in the law. He shows mercy to thousands of generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. So the Ten Commandments is a law of love because God is love, right? Uh, 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. God's nature, his character, his principles are all love. And the Ten Commandments are an expression of his love because he wants what's best for us. He wants what's best for everybody. He wants what's best for you. He loves you and he wants what's best for you. And what's best for you is to love him back and to keep his commandments. That's what's best for you. Whether you're little or whether you're big. Whoever you are. Now another point is that the way we show our love is by keeping his commandments. He says, those who love me and keep my commandments. See that? So love is expressed in obedience to God's law. And doesn't it make sense that we would show our love to God by putting him first and not having any idols? Does that appeal to your conscience? Does it make sense to you that you would show love for God by not bowing down to idols and by having other gods before him? It's, a, it's an expression of your love. So God shows mercy to us, which is what he did to Israel. He gave them the, the blood of the lamb through the mercy of God, through Jesus Christ, through his grace, through his forgiveness, his, his uh, gift of salvation, his mercy, he wants us to keep his commandments. Now in uh, John chapter, I believe it's 14 verse 10, or boy, I should know this. John 14, 10 or 15, 10, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Where is that verse? I should know this. <clears throat> 15, no, that's, that's actually not the verse. 15, 10 is not the verse. Uh, it's 14, 15, that's it. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And some people say, well, and that's not the 10 commandments. Those are Jesus' commandments. But I don't agree with that. Because what Jesus is doing is he's just quoting the second commandment. The second commandment says, talks about those who love me and keep my commandments. So when Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, he's quoting commandment number two. 
because he's God. Jesus is God. He's God in human form. He's the one that gave the Ten Commandments. These are his principles. And the reason why he died on the cross is because we have broken his eternal principles. That's why he died. That's why he paid the price on the cross for us. So that's the second commandment. Now, the third commandment is found in verse 7. Verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Does that sound like a good commandment or a bad commandment? Anything you want to change about that? No. And the commandment basically says to respect the name of God. When we speak of God, we should speak of him respectfully. We should speak of him in a humble way. We should speak of him with reverence because that's the principle of his government. You know, a, parent, a kid shouldn't go around disrespecting their parents. We, we shouldn't be disrespecting um, people that are in leadership position. doesn't mean you always agree with them. And, but we should still show respect for authority, respect for teachers, respect for ministers, respect for parents. Uh, because, you know, respect and, and reverence is a principle of God. And notice he says uh, that the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. In other words, that if we break the law, if we break the third commandment, then what are we? What do we become? We become guilty. He says the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In other words, instead of uh, guilt-free, that person will be guilty. So that shows us that in when we break God's law, we become guilty. Now, once a person is guilty of violating God's law, then what? You know, how can you get rid of your guilt? Can you get rid of your guilt by, by thinking, I'm gonna just try harder and I'll never do that again? Will that get rid of your guilt? No, the New Testament's clear that there's only one way to get rid of guilt, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ, right? That's the only way. So the, the Ten Commandments actually, when we understand them, they actually point us to Christ as our Savior because he's the only one that can remove the guilt, and we can't, and we can't do it on our own. So that's number three. Uh, number four is verses eight to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant nor your maidservant nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, most of us are pretty familiar with that commandment. Commandment number four, it's the only commandment that says, remember, don't forget. It specifies the seventh day being not the Sabbath of the Jews, but the Sabbath of the Lord. It's God's Sabbath, not man's Sabbath. It also applies to the stranger in verse 10, which applies to non-Jews. So it's not only dealing with uh, Jewish people. And then the reason in verse 11 is because he's the maker of all life. So he made the world in six days, he rested on the seventh day, and he gave us that day as a holy day to remember him for who he is. He's the one who gave us life and made us and got us here in the first place. Right? That's commandment number four. Now the first four commandments all have to do with God. Putting God first, no idols, don't take his name in vain, and keep his Sabbath holy. They, they are, uh, we might call them vertical commandments. They have to do with our relationship with him. 
But then when you go into verses, uh, the, the fifth commandment, going down through the rest of the commandments, they deal with this direction, our relationship with people. So number five says, honor your father and your mother. Uh, one day I was thinking about this and it really hit me that God wants me to honor my mom and my dad. And it doesn't say your perfect father and your perfect mother. My parents were not perfect and I'm a parent and I'm not perfect. And I don't think there's any perfect parents here. But even if we have imperfect parents, God still wants us to honor them and respect them because they were the ones that God used to get, get you here. <laughs> you know, you're here because God used your parents. And I'm very thankful that I really got this before my parents died and when my parents, both my mom and my dad died, that I, have, I can look back and know that I had a very good relationship with my dad and a very good relationship with my mom. And I'm very thankful for that. And if your parents are still alive and if you don't have that relationship, I would do everything you can do to try to smooth away the past and to make things right so that you're, you have as best of a good of relationship as possible with your parents. Now, I realize that in some cases that's not easy. And God understands all that, <clears throat> but he wants us to do it the best we can. And he says, remember the fourth and honor your parents. So there's 10 commandments. Most of them say you shall not, but there's one with remember and there's one with honor. And that's pretty significant. So he shifts from the vertical to the horizontal and he starts with the parents. So kids, I'm sure when you're growing up in a home, I'm sure your parents are teaching you to honor mom and dad. And that's what, you know, I, we, we teach our kids the same thing. And that's very important to honor your parents, respect them. Okay, number uh, six, verse 13. You shall not kill. And that is an eternal principle that God wants us to respect other people's lives. Now, killing is not just, you know, pulling a trigger in a gun. <clears throat> But uh, the, the New Testament says that if you hate somebody, you're a murderer. <clears throat> so God doesn't not only want us not to kill people, he doesn't want us to hate anybody. <clears throat> and that means anybody. You know, and so, uh, you know, prejudice because of people's skin color or their uh, <clears throat> economic backgrounds or how much money they have or anything like that <clears throat> is all out the window. It's all gone, according to God's principles. <clears throat> Somebody once asked a friend of mine who was an evangelist, he said, uh, <clears throat> how come there's so many colors in this world? <clears throat> and my friend said, oh, it's because God loves variety. <laughs> That's why he made so many different kinds of people with different colors, because he loves variety. Just like flowers are different. Same thing with colors. But every person is precious to the Lord and he wants us, he wants no prejudice. Uh, he wants us to be above all of this, you know, <clears throat> the arguments that are going on in social media. And he wants us to recognize people as people and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is God's law. These are the principles of his character. And I also have learned that not killing, you shall not kill, not only applies to killing other people, but it, it applies to killing ourselves. If you work too hard, or if you um, sleep too much, or if you eat too much of the wrong food, or if you have habits that are not good for your health, then what are you doing? You are slowly killing yourself. And, and that's wrong. Because God doesn't want us to kill ourselves. He's a good God and he wants us to be healthy, as healthy as possible in this sinful world and to be happy. So all of these principles are woven into his commandments. These are all principles of his government and they all make, they all make sense. Okay, number seven is a big one. Uh, verse 14, 
you shall not commit adultery. And that commandment is essentially dealing with sexual purity. Those who are married need to stay married and focus on their spouses. You know, like when you get married, you say, um, you know, I'm, you say your vows, and I'm not going to be, you know, going around with other women, nobody else. It's just you. <clears throat> Is that a good commandment or a bad one? It's a good one. God wants families and husbands and wives to be loyal to each other. And that's his, that's his principle. That's what he's all about. Because if, if uh, parents are committed to each other and love each other, then kids can grow up in a, in a safe and secure environment. It's good for the children. It's good for families. And that we don't commit adultery. And Jesus said adultery can even be thinking the wrong thoughts. You know, he said, if a man looks lustfully upon a woman, he's committed adultery already in his heart. And so it's not just the actions, <clears throat> but it's what's going on inside the heart. God wants sexual purity in the mind. And you know, I don't think there's ever been a time <clears throat> when we've had a bigger problem with that, than that issue, with that commandment than today. With the internet and uh, you know, all the uh, images of the immorality that are in this world, the Lord is looking to develop a people whose minds are clean, whose uh, marriages are intact, and who have good relationships with their children, and all of these principles, that's what God's looking for. That's what he wants. You know, it's a blessing staying with the Ramses, <laughs> staying in your little cabin, and looking at your family, looking at your children. It's just, um, it's very good to see a committed family raising their children for Jesus. And that's God's plan. Uh, and the only way that we can do that, that we can be sexually and morally pure, there's only one way. And that is through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living in us. There's no other way that we can do it. And that's one of his, one of his principles. Number eight is you shall not steal, which has to do with respecting other people's property. Uh, number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. God is a God of truth. He always speaks the truth. Jesus always said, I tell you the truth, I tell you the truth. And so <clears throat> Jesus wants us to learn to speak the truth and not to lie about other people. What do you think this world would be like if everybody kept these commandments? If there was no adultery, uh, no fornication, no sexual sin, respecting people's properties, no murder, and people weren't lying, what kind of a world would this be? It would be heaven. That's right. And guess what heaven's going to be like? What heaven's going to be like is there's going to be a whole lot of people who, who, who have been redeemed and cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb, whose guilt has been removed through Jesus Christ, who have his law in their hearts and in their minds, <clears throat> and they're going to be keeping the commandments. They're going to be loving God and respecting their neighbors, treating them fairly and justly and not lying about them, and it's going to be a perfect world. And that's what the devil's at war against. Does that make sense? That's why Satan hates these principles. I mean, he's, he's pretty pitiful, pretty miserable. How can you hate these principles? I mean, these are good principles. Uh, Revelation 14.5 talks about the 144,000, and it says, in their mouth was found no guile. They, will, they are without fault before the throne of God. God is developing a people who speak the truth. Amen. And I've been very convicted about this in our ministry, in our videos, our teachings, my writing, my books, what I say in front of audiences. I, and I'm, when I'm with people, I try to be very, very careful to say things that are true. And if you don't know what the situation is, it's better to just say, I don't know. It's better to admit that you don't know rather than get yourself into trouble and comment about something you know nothing about. Right? Right, Mark? That's right. That's a much better way to go. And the last commandment about coveting. Now, covetousness, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, 
nor his maid servant. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the Ten Commandments are very gender specific. Father, mother. Sons, daughters. Wife, you know, marriage. The Ten Commandments are very gender specific. There's only two genders in the Ten Commandments. There are not, there are not three or four or five or ten. And it's not a matter of who, what uh, gender you decide you're going to be today. <clears throat> the Ten Commandments are pretty straight. They say there's males and there's females. There's fathers and there's mothers. There's sons and there's daughters. There's wives and there's husbands. Uh, and I think that's a pretty important lesson for us today. Ten Commandments. And the Tenth Commandment dealing with covetousness, your, your neighbor's wife or manservant or maidservant nor his ox nor his ass, which means his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor, neighbor's. The, the other commandments deal with uh, words, the Ninth Commandment, property, the Eighth Commandment, uh, relationships, marriage, the Seventh Commandment, other people's physical lives, the sixth commandment, your parents, but the 10th commandment deals with your heart. It deals with uh, whether you covet in your heart something that somebody else owns that's not yours. And so it shows us that the 10 commandments don't just deal with, with our relationship with God and things and people and parents and words, and property. It also deals with the heart on whether we, you know, put, we, we covet and desire something that somebody else has as if it was our own, which really, or we want it as our own. And that's really, you know, the Lord says, don't covet because uh, be content with what you have. He says, because I, the Lord, will never lead you or forsake never leave you or forsake you. So covetousness betrays a lack of satisfaction with the things that God has given us. And it deals with the heart. And it shows that God wants to cleanse the heart. The Ten Commandments point to the heart. They're not just outward things and actions. They deal with our hearts. And that's it. That's all ten of them. And verse 18 says, all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. God spoke all those words to the people. And they said to Moses, speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They were overwhelmed. And Moses said to the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you or test you that his fear may be before your faces and that you sin not. It's an amazing statement. And what Moses is saying is, first of all, don't be afraid. God is not calling you to a life of fear. God doesn't give us the Ten Commandments because he wants us to be afraid. God's goal is to have us not be afraid, not be in bondage, but to be free. That's what his goal is. That's why he gives us the Ten Commandments. And then he said, uh, don't be afraid. He said, God has come to, to prove you or test you, which tells us that the law is a test. We're tested by the law. He said he's come to test you that his fear may be before your faces. In other words, that God and his will and his commandments and his law which is the foundation of his throne, that this should be the guiding principle of your life. And that, and that you sin not. And that shows us that it's when we break the law, that is what sin is. When you break the commandments, that's sin. Now here's a very important point. Once we've, the New Testament is very clear that once we've broken the commandments, and really we've all broken them, haven't we? There's not one of us 
that can look at the Ten Commandments and say, like my father-in-law did mistakenly, that I've always kept the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> we have all broken at least one of them. And the Holy Spirit, you know, searches our hearts and our consciences and goes deeper and deeper and deeper. I remember one time I was at my house and I was, I used to play uh, pinball games as a kid in arcades in Studio City, California. And you go into these arcades and you put in, the, you know, a quarter and you pull back the lever and the ball goes out and then it starts hitting different things. And when it hits something, it lights up. And I remember one time I was in my room and I was thinking about the Ten Commandments and looking at them and the Lord was really speaking to my heart and it was like Commandment 10 lit up like a pinball game. And I thought I'd broken that one. And then the fourth one lit up and the first one and the ninth one and the seventh one. Then one by one, they all lit up. And I just said, I am sunk. <clears throat> I've broken every one of them. But the good news is that when you know you're a sinner, when you know you've broken the law, that's where the grace of God comes in. That's where Jesus' grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, because the sanctuary reveals to us that even though the tables are under uh, the golden lid, inside the ark, on top is the mercy seat. And then on the Day of Atonement, which is what our last meeting will be in just a little bit, on the Day of Atonement, the blood goes on top of the golden lid, which cleanses the sanctuary and the people from their violations of the law of God. So God's answer to the sin problem is Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation, and his blood. And, and that's where the law and the gospel come together. The law is still there. It's the principles of God's throne. God wants us to keep the law. But if we break the law, he doesn't want us to be discouraged. He wants us to realize that there's hope for the hopeless and the helpless. And that no matter how many times you've committed a sin, God's grace and his mercy is available at least for a little while longer, his mercy is still available. Now, before we're done here, I've got to take you to uh, Matthew 22. Uh, Matthew 22. Well, I think my voice has improved a little bit. Praise God. <clears throat> We're doing good. We're going to make it. Matthew 22, verse 36. Uh, a lawyer came to Jesus, tempting him, and he said, verse 36, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And this is really a summary of the first four commandments having to do with our relationship with God. And he's actually quoting from Deuteronomy. And then in verse 39, and the second is like to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So some people say all we need is two commandments, we don't need 10 commandments. But, but Jesus said that uh, all the law is hanging on the two. So the 10 hang on the two. And the two don't replace the 10, the 10 hang on the two, right? And the two summarize the 10. Because remember we read, or I, I quoted uh, 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. God is a God of love. And the Ten Commandments are principles that reflect his character of love. And they're summarized in the two great principles of loving God. If we love God, we won't have any idols, we won't take his name in vain, we'll keep the Sabbath. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, we'll respect our parents, we won't lie about them, we won't steal from them, we won't hate them, we won't be prejudiced against them, we won't shoot them, you know, anything like that. 
Uh, we won't covet our neighbor's uh, you know, wife or anything else because we genuinely love our neighbor as ourselves. So that's what the law is all about. And that's what God is all about. And that's what his throne is all about. That's what uh, is the foundation of his throne. <clears throat> now that cannot be overemphasized. God is preparing a people in these last days. And here's, uh, here's one more text, Revelation 14, verse 12. And all of this is encompassed in the verse about the temple of God being opened and the ark being seen. All God is trying to direct the eyes of men and women and children to his commandments, to the foundation of his throne. That's why he takes us in to the most holy place. And Revelation 14, verse 12, describes a people. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is Jesus Christ's goal as a high priest, is to wash away people's sins and to write the law in their hearts and to enable them by the grace of God to be commandment keepers so that they love God and love their neighbors as themselves. That's where the Lord is, is leading a people in these last days. And, and I believe that when the final crisis comes, and we're going to get into you know, the final closing work of Christ in the next meeting, <clears throat> that God is developing a people that are commandment-keeping people that have his love in their hearts for God and for their neighbors, like themselves. And it doesn't do any good. Maybe it does do some good, but not that much good. If we take a stand in the last days for issues on the right side of the issue, <clears throat> but if we have no love in our hearts for the people that are on the wrong side, <clears throat> we're commandment breakers. It's not enough just to stand up for what's right, as important as that is. We have to have love for the people that we're trying to reach. And if we don't have love for people on all sides of the spectrum, and that applies to those that are Democrats, those who are Republicans, Hillary Clinton, uh, <laughs> Trump, Biden, those who are vaccinated, those who are unvaccinated, those who are on this side of an issue, those who are on that side of an issue, you know, black lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter, you know, whatever side of whatever issue people land on in these last days, you know, God wants us to be above the, the world's current that is full of hatred and hostility for those that are on the other side. Jesus doesn't share that spirit. When Jesus hung on the cross, the people that were crucifying him, you know, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He washed Judas' feet even though he betrayed him. Jesus loved the Romans. He loved the Pharisees. He loved the Sadducees. He loved Nicodemus. He loved the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the harlots. He loved everybody. And God is leading a people in these last days to have his law in their hearts and all these principles that are the foundation of his throne, which are summarized in love, God is leading a people to have more love than this world has. You know, Jesus said, the love of many will grow cold, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And he's talking about enduring with love in your heart and not being swept into all these false currents or currents or whatever and uh, losing your love for God and for people. That's what Jesus Christ up in heaven is trying to accomplish in the hearts of his people. It's his closing work. His closing work is to wash away our sins through his blood and to write his law into our hearts 
so that we love him and love our neighbors as ourselves. And when that work is done, he's going to return. And then we'll take a break. And our last meeting, uh, we're going to go into the scapegoat issue and our personal battle with the devil over these very issues that we're looking at. I mean, these are the big issues. You know, there's a lot of issues in this world. In this world, And I look at different issues and I look at different people and how they respond to issues. And I think to myself, the Lord just speaks to me and he says, Steve, I want you to be on the right side of the big issue. And the big issue is his commandments, the foundation of his throne and the issue of whether I love him and I love my neighbor as myself. I don't have that, I've missed the boat. And if we have that, then we're getting ready for the boat that's going to take us up to glory. Make sense? <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving my voice the strength. Uh, thank you so much. I sense your Holy Spirit here. Please uh, speak to all of our hearts about your law, about the commandments, about where we have violated, where we have transgressed your holy law, which is the, which is the, the, the foundation of your government and of your kingdom that's going to last forever. Please help us to have those principles inside of us, develop them inside of us, forgive us for our sins through the blood of Jesus, and get us ready for heaven and for the final closing work of Christ in the most holy place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, praise the Lord.